OK, great. Thanks very much. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, having me, inviting me here. Um, I've learned loads already. I've only been here for two hours. And I'm going to uh, emphasize that when I see people who have experienced some of our Canterbury system learning, um, they're all really enthusiastic. So if you've been to Canterbury, New Zealand and seen their system, that's great. If you know a little bit about it, it usually gives people a bit of, of energy. And usually people take slightly different things from the conversations they've had around uh, Canterbury and New Zealand. So what you're going to hear from me is what we in South Tyneside have taken from our conversations uh, with the Canterbury team uh, and what we've done over the last four years to try and kind of um, emulate some of the work that they are doing. So you're going to hear a little bit about my journey. I'm happy to be interrupted now we've started early. If you have any burning questions, I will try really hard to leave time at the end, although it's very difficult. I have a lot to say, so cramming into 20 minutes is really tricky. So I'm going to take some liberties, uh, like I'm not going to tell you where South Tyneside is, because I think you know it's on the south of the Tyne. Um, and I ain't going to tell you too much about me personally. So. Um, we met the Canterbury uh, District Health Board team kind of randomly four years ago. We were a health and social care pioneer, which is a bit like um, uh, the getting uh, linked up with people who have expertise uh, across the world. We were very fortunate that we were partnered with Canterbury. They described their system as um, feeling really disjointed, disconnected and not very integrated. And that felt exactly like our NHS was back in 2012-13 after the Andrew Lansley reforms and it just felt r really disconnected. And we in South Tyneside were desperate to try and put that together in a bit more of a coherent fashion, like lots of and lots of other places. I know your system is, is slightly different rather than in it in its, by its very nature feels a little more integrated than, than ours does on the other side of the border. But um, we were desperate to find a way of making it look a little more like this. And this schematic which Canterbury use does, I, I think, genuinely reflect how their system looks and feels. So they are a much more integrated bunch. The patient looks like it's really genuinely at the centre. And I was lucky enough to go to Canterbury. And that's not just a drawing. It really is a reflection of how things work over there. So we loved it. And we thought, how can we do stuff that looks a bit more like Canterbury and a little bit less like our um, current NHS and social care? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we learned from that experience of talking to them. They are relentless about putting the patient first. They are focused on their model patient. You, I'm really pleased to see, have got Wynne, who's your model patient too. So you've already stolen uh, that notion, which I think, certainly for Canterbury, really anchors them as somewhere in their system, which is important for the person. We loved it. Um, they have a genuine whole system approach. You guys in the room know that actually what you do in a GP surgery will have a <coughs> material impact on what happens in a hospital. What happens in the third sector has a material impact on what happens in your councils. Everyone is really connected. We know that. But we still behave as if we can exist in an organisational silo and somehow uh, one organisation will win and another will lose. When in fact we really all win and lose together. And that that sense was completely palpable uh, from Canterbury. Um, they really focus on letting frontline staff make more decisions, not less. So they deliberately push decision making closer to the person and to the patient. And that takes a lot of practice. Um, they describe this taking money off the table. And they don't say that money is not important. but what we have done, I think, is spent a lot of time in the NHS and social care getting people to understand the price and the cost of things and kind of forgetting about what about the right thing to do. So we have a boatload of clinicians out there who will tell you, you know, how much it costs for an outpatient appointment, how much it costs for a piece of hip surgery. They know all of that stuff. Well, how much do they really focus on just doing the right thing? I think we've lost some of that. The notion of taking the money off the table and getting particularly clinicians to talk about the things that are important to patients was something that was really strong and which we loved, basically. Um, they've started to remake the connections in Canterbury between primary and secondary care. Somehow we've lost the ability for GPs to talk to doctors and people in secondary care. It was I don't know how we did it, but it was pretty effective. So there's a lovely kind of... Mm, 
um, brick wall that we've built between our primary and secondary care, we just need to knock it down. And there are a few things that we've done that I think are starting to help do that. One of which is health pathways, which you guys will probably know about, so I'm not going to talk about uh, health pathways today. What they didn't do was restructure. So they left their organisations and their governance and decision making exactly the same. They said, we're not going to mess about because moving deck chairs around is a very good way of looking like you're busy but not changing the fundamental conversation that you have. So well, they didn't do that, which we loved. Um, but changing the conversation from an organisation focus to a system focus is hard. It's really hard because, you know, in our world, our foundation trusts have got it written in their constitution that they must make a profit, they must grow their business, they must see more patients. Nothing written in their constitution which said you must improve the health of the population. Nothing that says you must do the right thing for patients. It just says grow your business and make a profit. So changing that attitude is really quite hard work because it is ingrained. So we've begun to talk much more openly um, and honestly, saying we know that this is the sort of behaviour that we've learned and we know the impact that it's having, so how about we change it? So that's what we've, we've, we've gone about doing. And one of the ways we've done that is to steal an idea from Canterbury called the Alliance Leadership Team. They describe getting the key opinion leaders from organisations in a room together. Not necessarily the chief executives, but the people whose, uh, who, whose opinion matters. The people who you'd go to in an organisation if you wanted something done. So we dutifully did that across our system. So we had a bunch of um, people to bring perspectives across all of our sectors. The thing about the Alliance Leadership Team is it's different. We wanted to focus on behaviours, not on doing stuff. So, um, what I'm sharing with you now is the agendas and the minutes and the papers of the last two years' worth of Alliance Leadership Team meetings. There aren't any. So, we deliberately said, we're going to have a conversation about what it takes to change our behaviours. Because there's a boatload of stuff over here that we're, that we're doing, we know just reinforces our behaviours. How about we really talk about what it looks like if we put the patient first, not our organisation? What will that look like? Mm. And then you get in some really deep, difficult conversations. And people don't like it because it's not a safe place. So it's a uncomfortable, like toes are curling in people's shoes as you sit round in a circle. By the way, we sit round in a circle. Um, <coughs> there isn't a table, you know, there isn't, there isn't papers. There's not a business plan, there's not a strategy. It's, okay, what are behaviours going to look like for people? in our organisations, in our system. So uh, that's our Alliance Leadership Team, by the way. Um, and they... What's the make of the team, David? Good. What's the make of the team? Yeah, there's a bunch of people here from um, Adult Social Care. He's a GP clinical director, head of children's services. She's a uh, head of nursing at the hospital. Our director of finance. She's a late invitee to the party. There was so much going on there. She went, hey, how, why can't I come to the Alliance Leadership Team? It sounds really great. So, uh, so health and care, third sector, director of public health, who chairs it. Uh, at this point in the event, uh, integrated commissioning unit, da, 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 so. big cross-sector stuff. And the conversations are, um, they're both difficult and different. We're getting into the swing of it now, we've been doing it for two years, but yeah, it does get to the heart of, hmm, this is what's going on in our organisations. How are we going to make it feel like it's more system-centric? Uh, so it's great. So we've started to do some things on the back of those conversations. So we have uh, started to do much more in terms of risk sharing, sharing financial risk and others. And we've developed um, a system recovery plan. So we deliberately got a bunch of clinicians in a room. There was about 70 or 80 of them in a room and said um, primary, secondary care, across the board, AHPs, all that stuff. And said, we think um, that this system could do better than this. And when there are probably things that we're doing that we could stop doing. What do you think we should stop doing? And you know what it's like when you get GPs and consultants in a room. There's always a bit of kind of, yeah, well, why are you sending me all these patients when there's nothing wrong with them? Well, why are you prescribing all those drugs that those people don't need? And I can look after those people in, in primary care. So there's a bit of that going on. But then pretty soon that dissipates and you go, yeah, but come on then. What should we be doing? Um, so... And they've come up with a bunch of ideas of things that we should stop doing. Outpatient clinics are going to be completely revamped. We're going to completely look at the model of shared care with uh, primary and secondary care. Um, so our system recovery plan 
is going to be written from the bottom up. So it's based on all those ideas that those, those guys have uh, come up with. Um, so I think we started not just to talk the talk, but to walk the walk. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the things that we've, we've done practically, just to demonstrate to the system that we want to do things differently. Because um, doing things that are best for patient and best for system uh, is not doing what's best for your organization. And we deliberately talk about that all the time. Um, uh, feels like it's a team game uh, in South Tyneside now, not an individual sport, but I'll let you be the judge, I guess. So, we, we like to promote a really high trust, low bureaucracy system. So, um, embarrassingly, um, I just come back from New Zealand in 2016, and uh, we were just about to refresh our GP incentive scheme. You probably have one of these. It's a, it's a way of getting practices to do a little bit of the work that's not really technically in their contract. Da, da, da. So this is spreadsheet one out of five of our GP incentive scheme for 2016. Each of these lines represents a bit of work that they need to do to tick a box to get some money. There's probably about 3p a line, I would imagine, on there. So it's like, that's what we do. We didn't deliberately set out to make the scheme like this. It wasn't our intention. There were some patient outcomes behind all that that was like a really good idea at the time. And then we suddenly got ourselves into five spreadsheets like this. What the heck did we do there? So luckily, I'd just come back from New Zealand. So I was like, Phew. how about we rethink this? So we, uh, for 2018, we said, why don't you just have the money? Um, have a look at your data because there's a lot of data in primary care, understand what your practice is good at, what it's not so good at, um, and, and do some improvement work. We were that rigid. And produce a, produce a poster at the end of it. That was, that was the uh, ask. There was a practice that said, do we really have to produce a poster? But you can't, you can't please all the people all the time. Um, so it wasn't easy getting that approach through our executive and governing body, because people said, you can't just give your GPs money, you're a GP organisation, you CCGs. And they said, the people will just take the money and they won't do any work. Uh, look, if people are going to take the money and not do any work, they would have ticked the boxes in the old scheme anyway. So it's like, it's no big deal. And frankly, the vast majority of people want to do good work. So let's let them do good work. So we did. Um, the posters the, at the GP education session where they were shared uh, was probably one of the most uplifting experiences I've ever had. We had 28 practices in the room, all uh, going around viewing the posters on the wall. There was some fantastic patient-facing, real improvement work that, frankly, we couldn't have bought uh, however many boxes we ticked on the old in incentive scheme. It was fantastic. And of course, you also couldn't buy the level of trust that we got from our practices either. They kind of just loved it. They went, yeah, that's what we want. Trust us to do good work. So we did. And it's just how we're trying to shift the dial a little bit in our conversations. Um, in terms of the money, just wanted to highlight, it's not that we ignore the money, um, but we have started to act like the money isn't the CCGs, it belongs to the system. Um, so um, we have moved several years ago from the standard PBR contract to a block contract. So we get basically say, look, this is not working. Um, this tariff-based system uh, doesn't incentivize people to do the right thing. So how about we just quit with that? And we have a standard block contract, and then, then we can focus on doing what is right rather than doing what makes money. Uh, that's worked extremely well. It's not the answer, but it is a part of the solution, uh, I think. And then you can start focusing on um, the clinical priorities that have come out of those conversations, say, right, okay, that's, that's our work. That's, that's what our strategy is. Uh, we begin to do a lot more risk pooling, with particularly with our council from, uh, from the CCG's um, point of view. And continuing healthcare. Um, you do have continuing healthcare here, I gather. I was hoping you didn't. I was hoping you didn't. That's a shame. Damn. We do. I know, it's great. It's a joy for everyone. Um, so, like most people, our, our CHC spend in South Townside was doing that, exponentially rising. Um, and what we would do is we'd put more checks and balances in place. So we put more hurdles in place for people to jump over before um, the referrals were made and the process, da, 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 da. And all we did was prolong the time for decisions to be made, but we were spending more and more money. So we said, hang on, how about if we let frontline staff decide what the person needs and just get it? and not worry about who's paying for it. So we literally said, these, these are social work staff and frontline nursing staff said, just you take the responsibility. So we've delegated that, and that's about 16 million pounds in terms of our budget. Um, 
and we're starting to see a real change in CAT. So our spend is topping out now, the speed of processing referrals is going through the roof, so we're now hitting our 28-day target, and guess what? People feel better. And I suspect that patients are getting what they need much, much quicker. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, the other thing we did was we had a, a couple of million quid worth of non-recurring money come back to us uh, this year from the CCG. It was our own money, of course, but it's a devil's own job to get it out of NHS England. Um, so we uh, decided that the CCG wouldn't decide how we'd spend that money. We would ask the system how we spent that money. So we asked all of our alliances, because there are a bunch of alliances out there, and said, if you've got any bright ideas, tell us what they are. We've got 41 expressions of interest. Uh, we went through them uh, as an ALT, so the ALT made the decisions, not the CCG, and the CCG just went, yeah, that's fine, do it. So we've changed the way we, we are even allocating some of our money. It'd be nice if we started to think about the 380 million rather than just the, the 2 million. It's starting to feel a little bit like we're all in the same boat in South Tyneside, because um, if there's a hole in anyone's boat, we're stuffed. Um, what difference has it made? is what I hear you ask. Um, so I'm going to tell you a couple of things. This is the staff survey, and this is all of the CCGs ranked by, the, these are the average positive scores. This is good, this is bad. Uh, that's where South Tyneside is. So people like working in our organisation. What do our partners say about us? There's a whole stakeholder survey which you send out to a whole bunch of people, and basically our results look like this. This is the basic you look at. So way better positive scores than uh, our regional or national uh, colleagues. Our patients are getting better care. A boatload of indicators I could share with you. This is just one of them, stroke care. We've seen a massive improvement in our SNAP data, so people are getting much more high quality, hands-on patient care too. So, my learning, my kind of feedback, are these the kind of things that I think we need to do more of and I would encourage you to do more of in your system. So, Time to talk, trust each other, learn to say yes to frontline staff. Frailty gate, I will mention very briefly. I'll be sh you know, quick as I can. Um, a GP practice um, uh, emailed me and said, hey, we think we could do with a frailty nurse. We've got a cohort of old frail people and we just haven't got the resource. Can we have a frailty nurse? And I went, I know, flush of yes, learning to say yes. Yes, don't have one, have two frailty nurses. Great idea, which was fantastic the 27 other practices took a slightly different <laughs> view. There was almost a vote of no confidence in the CCG. People were calling for my head, and it was really tricky. So learning to say yes does come with its challenges. But it was still the right thing to do. Um, focus on behaviours. That is the thing that will make a difference in your system, not your structures. Uh, and stick at it, because it's hard. This is, if this was easy stuff, again, everyone would be doing it, wouldn't they? But they're not. Um, do not worry about structures. It is not what will get you out of jail. Um, do not focus on the money. And this is hard. So when it doesn't happen overnight, don't worry. And whatever you do, don't give one practice two frailty nurses. That's, prob <laughs> <laughs> That's probably <laughs> a mistake we will not be uh, repeating. You can have these slides, by the way. So you, you, I'm happy for you to take pictures, but you, you can certainly have them. Um, and, I, and I guess our key learning, uh, how you do things is really much more important than, than what you do. So uh, our focus has been relentlessly on behaviour. Uh, I would encourage you to do the same. I must have about 30 seconds left for questions. Yeah, you literally <laughs> have one minute, 10 seconds. Okay. I'll be quick. How much, what was the natural sharing that occurred out of the, the work that the GP practices did? Did they naturally <gasps> share with one another? Oh, that's did a great idea. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Uh, no, is the short answer, because they, they, they weren't practised at doing that. That wasn't in their DNA, their, their 28 separate businesses, so they hadn't. It was the start of the learning, because a lot of the posters had a similar theme, so we're now encouraging that. So in the next round, we said, um, we think you guys should talk to each other, because you've done a really similar project, or why don't you talk to him, because you've done it. So that's been a really slow process. So it encourages it, because it puts them in a room in a learning environment. We have completely restructured our GP education sessions, by the way. So there's none of the short and talk stuff now. It's small groups, conversations. That's what it does. As a system, where do you 
where, where was the most resistance and how did you overcome that? Oh gosh, you know, I think pretty much there's resistance at almost every step of the way on this journey. So the foundation trust in terms of how they be how the behaviour is focused on money was is really, really tough. So you have to just chip away at all of that. Engagement with primary care is really hard. Not because primary care um, clinicians want to be difficult, just because it's not the way they're set up. So there are real challenges at, at, at every step of the way. We find that we often have people who are taking what look like opposing viewpoints. Having an alliance leadership team creates a separate space and a third, a third viewpoint because the ALT really focuses on doing the right thing for the patient and the person. So uh, it's a good way of kind of helping to resolve that conflict. So it's a great question. Don't tell me I'm finished ahead of time. 